Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, the Lord is, uh, if you look at the verses above, uh, it says that, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Okay, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Okay. So, he's talking about, uh, first is our salvation itself, when we come to the Lord, is uh, not with our works. Right? It's not with our works. And uh, it's by grace we have come into this uh, new life in the Lord. And uh, he makes it very clear that all the good works which we could have done, Right? Somebody would have said, I kept all the law. Right? Uh, but it's of no use before the Lord. All your good works, whatever good things you would have done uh, before coming to the Lord Jesus Christ is of no use. You are not saved because of your good works. Okay? You are saved because of His grace. Okay? Now we all know that. But then it's continuing on from there onwards. Right? He's saying now, after you're saved, right? verse number 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. He's telling that after you're saved, you come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in this new life, the Lord is continuing to work in each one of our lives. Right? He is still working and he is still guiding us and molding every one of us. And we talked about... Uh, uh, the discipline of the Lord the last time and I uh, just want to quickly uh, um, give some backgrounds to connect the, the two uh, messages last time we talked about uh, David being disciplined by the Lord and God gives him three options right? he gives him three options saying that uh, um, either uh, you'll get sickness right, and uh, there will be a plague in the land or uh, uh, you'll have enemies come and uh, overtake you, or you'll have famine. Right? And he said that uh, those are some of the three categories which God uses generally in our lives as well for discipline. And when God is disciplining us, we could have uh, sickness where the Lord sometimes uses uh, physical infirmities right? uh, to correct us and to bring us to an understanding that uh, the Lord wants to show that uh, your life is going on the wrong track and that is one of the ways which the Lord shows. And another way which talked about is uh, uh, famine. Right? Famine is where uh, you lose your provision. Right? Uh, it's a, there's a job or, or whatever, your, some financial, uh, there is a loss in your finances, there's some uh, big this thing which comes in and or you, you have to spend a lot of money towards that. So there's a financial uh, way which the Lord brings judgment or discipline for us to realize that, uh, oh, I'm going in the wrong track and God is telling me that uh, I should correct my ways. Then the other way that the Lord corrects us is uh, through other people, uh, through enemies. It may not be literal, we don't have enemies uh, in this world right now. But it's now people around us. Right? Either you have a bad experience in, in traffic or somebody treats you badly, I mean, whatever, right? Somebody cheats you or your bosses mistreat you. All of us have trouble with bosses, right? Sometimes it's your relatives, right? They bring so much pressure into our lives and uh, we realize that we are under a lot of pressure. Sometimes we have to realize that, that it is the Lord who is disciplining us, who is bringing that into our lives. So when we talk about discipline, 
uh, it looks uh, like oh this is very hard right it's not a pleasant thing when when uh, god is disciplining us and uh, i want to using this uh, today's message show what is the heart of the lord when we are when we are going to discipline what is the intention of the lord it's not as if uh, oh you did wrong so i'm going to come and get you right it's not tit for tat you did something wrong so you have to now be disciplined that is not the intention of the lord right? if, if that was the intention of the lord most people see god that way right that uh, when we go and fall or we stumble in the lord's presence we have such a fear before the lord saying that oh uh, he might come and discipline me in some way right? and we have fear and our our image of god gets changed because of that right? we change our image of god from him being a loving father to being some kind of a disciplinarian and sometimes we are the hard disciplinarian um, parents or teachers right and we always are afraid of that sometimes our fear of god becomes like that right that god is such a strict person and i better not i better get everything right or i'm going to get this uh, tough discipline and sometimes our lives are because oh i do not want to uh, uh, have any of these troubles in my life so for that sake i will i'll try to live a holy life but the intention is all the wrong intention if you only correct your behavior for the sake of external fear that's not what the lord wants the lord wants us to change from the inside and discipline is a way for us to correct us so that we change from the inside not to uh, change on the exterior that you will not do a certain thing but still your desires are still not cleansed right so that's the context and uh, the lord is saying it is his responsibility as he said over here it is his responsibility now that we are his workmanship he is not distancing himself out from our lives and he is not telling you okay now you perform and come to me let's see whether you will do a good job or not okay i'm going to put all these hurdles in front of you right and let's see whether you will cross all these hurdles or not or oh, you st- you stumbled on this hurdle come let's go and get discipline in this life that is not the heart of the lord right many people have a wrong impression of the lord and that's why we can't reach out to the lord and see his love in our lives right so he's the lord is telling that uh, the intention of the lord is not that you some of figure out a way to cross all these hurdles to navigate through all these temptations and then come and seek me Lord Sikeshi is saying this I am part of your life I am the one who is working in your life you are my workmanship the lord is saying you are my workmanship you are my job it's my job to bring you over to bring you to the right side so it's such a comfort when you know that the lord is on your side it's not that the lord is somewhere far and now you have to somehow figure out a way to go and get to him right that's the big chain that we have to understand in the new testament the old testament was always that people were striving to go and meet a bar which was the law right in the new testament the lord says you are my workman right which means that i'm going to be part of your life and i'm going to start changing you and molding you and uh, things which were the biggest disgrace in your life things which which you embarrass the lord so much those are the ones which i'll come and i'll correct them right so that the same places where you had the biggest failures and you are a disgrace to your god almighty that is the same place that the lord wants to get the most victory right and we want to i want to show a couple of uh, examples to explain um, what i'm trying to say we go to uh, uh, john the last chapter It talks about that uh, many people have covered this but i want to bring a different context to that john last chapter uh, 
where the Lord Jesus Christ is restoring Peter. Right? Lord Jesus Christ is restoring Peter. So Peter, uh, Peter, as we all know, uh, the Lord predicts and tells up front what is really in his heart. Right? Outside he is like, Lord, I will not deny you. I will die for you. Right? His verbal expression was all that, but the Lord knew how he was really inside. The Lord knew that inside he was still a reed, which means that his old nature was, he can fluctuate anyway. The Lord prophetically tells, calls him Peter, which is he's a rock, but the Lord knows that inside he is still, right now, in his life, he's still a reed. Which means that though he can tell, Lord, I will die for you, I will, if everybody else leaves you and runs away, but me, I'll not die. I'll not run. I'll come and uh, die with you. Right? But the Lord knows his internal heart and his internal condition. Right? And the Lord wants to expose that up front. Rather than Peter miscalculating his own life, thinking that he's, oh, because I am with the Lord Jesus all this time, I have somehow become like, like the rock. Right? So the Lord wants to expose his true state, uh, standard, or his true standing uh, before the Lord. And at the cross, uh, we all know at the Garden of Geth Gethsemane, he runs away. Right? He didn't show any... <laughs> He was uh, no better than any of the other disciples. Right? The true condition of his heart is exposed. And he runs away. Not only runs away, he tries to attempt again, come back and figure out, is there a way that I can follow Jesus at a distance? And he tries to do that. And uh, he goes and uh, he tries to keep a distance from the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he knows his word. Right? Uh, his intention is, Lord, I, uh, I do not want to deny you. Right? But then, when the, 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 the challenge comes again, a small girl challenges him saying that, hey, you speak like your accent is same accent as his Galileans. You might be with Jesus. And then he goes back to his exact old nature. He uses all filthy language, cursing, all that. And he says, I don't know Jesus. So you know his exact stage that he is like a reed. Though his external expression is, Lord, I want to do all these things for you. I want to live a holy life for you. I'll die for you. Right? But when the, when the encounter comes, and the challenge comes, he flips the other way. Right? He's like a reed. The, the water will come, and uh, it, might, it might flow this way. The water will flow this way. The reed bends this way. And the water flows that way. The reed bends that way. Right? So, exactly the opposite nature of a rock where a rock is, uh, he's talking about all the context in the water, right? The rock is, uh, water comes, but the rock doesn't shake, right? Uh, the water might come and try to shake it as much as possible, but the rock doesn't shake. That nature of God has still not formed in Peter, right? That nature of uh, the rock, which is the nature of Christ, has still not formed in Peter. So, uh, the context in John, the last chapter is, the Lord Jesus comes back again and uh, uh, one, one key thing is, uh, I'll read a couple of verses here and there. So they're all fishing and they're in a, in a boat and Jesus comes and he says, throw the net on the other side and then they catch a lot of fish, right? Um, and then the Lord Jesus says, um, yes, the verse number 7, uh, chapter 21, verse number 7. Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loud said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. See, he is doing exactly the same thing which Adam and Eve did, right? Where you are encountering the Lord again. And uh, there is shame in your life. There is guilt and shame in your life. 
So you still want to go to the Lord's presence and then he puts an outer garment which is trying to cover his shame, right? his embarrassment that he has, he has betrayed the Lord. Right? This Lord Jesus Christ who he said that you are God Almighty and he, he made the confession and Jesus Christ said that on this rock I will build this uh, temple or uh, my, my church and he had such high hopes and then he denied the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's so embarrassed of himself. He's so embarrassed of himself. It's like us. Right? Sometimes when we fail the Lord, he's so embarrassed. We can't even come into the Lord's presence. And we're so ashamed of ourselves. We feel the Lord I had to do probably something to cover myself before I come into your presence. And we use a exterior covering which the Lord exposes, says, hey, that's what Adam did. It's fig leaves. That's not what will correct you. Right? Always the way to correction is uh, repentance. And uh, the Lord, uh, uh, for the three times that he denies, um, the Lord restores him three times again. He asks him, do you love me? Uh, and actually, if you look at the Greek that I shared this once, um, he actually says, uh, do you agape me? And uh, Peter responds back saying that, uh, I feel yours you, which means that agape is the highest uh, um, nature of love and Peter is, is only responding in a one step lower. He's responding in a one step lower, which is a brotherly love. And feel yours is a brotherly love. Agape is a uh, unconditional love, which is father's love. Okay. Even look at uh, Second Peter, when you look at the faith to love, that uh, journey which he talks about uh, in the Divine Nature passage. He talks about uh, the last two is brotherly love and then love. Brotherly kindness and love. Which is exactly filios love and agape love. And he then understands the journey is not at filios love, which is just brotherly love. It is unconditional love. If the Lord wants it to be unconditional, without any more conditions, that is the love which the Lord wants uh, from every one of us. So, uh, Peter is restored and uh, the Lord gives him back the ministry back. Right? The ministry which uh, the Lord has promised him where he said that uh, on this rock I will build the, my church. He restores that ministry back to Peter. <coughs> but still, if you think of it from the Lord's perspective, think about Peter. Now Peter has to go and preach this message that we all have to lay down our lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter is the forefront of this message where he has to now go and preach. This is Jesus Christ who died on the cross and the Lord is asking every one of us to lay down our lives. Which means that it doesn't mean that literally you go and die in some ISIS attack or something but lay down your physical life, your your physical life, your own in, your own interests, your own wants, your own desires, right? And uh, choose the Lord's desires. And, but that's not the context of today's message. He has to go and preach this message. How can he preach this message when he himself has denied the Lord? How can he go and preach this message? Everybody will say, hey, but Peter, you're preaching, lay down your life for the Lord Jesus Christ. But you didn't lay it down. You failed the Lord Jesus Christ. So it means that it's just only theology. It's not reality. And it's just some theology where you're saying, oh, we all should lay down a life for Christ. Because you could not do it, Peter. So you're only just talking some theoretical things that, oh, we'll have to do, we'll all have to lay down a life for Christ. So the Lord knows that up front. And this is what the Lord does. Okay. Um, go, go to verse number 18. John 21 verse number 18. Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke signifying 
by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. I'll read it again. Moses surely has said to you, when you are younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. You will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Now everybody knew the context when, when somebody said this thing, they knew what the context was. Right? The, the whole context was somebody stretch out your hands. This, everybody knew that context was, was cross. Right? Somebody will stretch out your hands. Right? They knew that as soon as somebody, that, that was a common language probably in those days to represent or somebody stretching out your hands where you do not wish is the cross. Which is why uh, John also interprets that in verse number 19. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. Right? John interprets what the Lord Jesus says because it's already signifying by what death he would glorify God. Can you get the word please? So the Lord Jesus Christ is upfront telling Peter, Peter though you have denied me, though you have rejected me and you do not have a testimony before the law, before people. Now when you go and preach this message, when you go and say, lay down your life for the cross, though you do not, you feel embarrassed that you do not have a testimony. How can I go and face people and say, lay down your life for this Lord Jesus Christ? Take up the cross and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. How can you preach? The Lord Jesus Christ prophetically restores him back and says, you will die a glorious death. What you thought you could not do, though you really wanted to do, but you could not do it. At the start of your ministry, you could not do it. But the Lord is prophetically telling him that you will die a glorious death. You will take up that cross. You will die on the cross. By that you will glorify him. So the Lord is restoring Peter and Peter's confidence is now gone. Right? Now it's not that he's saying I will die and I will be, uh, I'll follow the Lord Jesus to death. The Lord Jesus Christ himself is promising, I am your workmanship. I am going to work in you so much that when the point comes in your life to deny yourself, and take up the cross, you will do it. That's the great promise which the Lord is giving every one of us. It is not that you are struggling and striving to do and keep a holy life. It's the Lord who is saying, I am going to do it. And the process which he does is, is discipline. Okay. Now we understand the context, right? The process is, you have to submit yourself to the Lord. You have to submit yourself to His calling and how He will work His life, His, his image in you. The way He works in our life is through discipline. He corrects us. He, he, he transforms us through discipline. Right? But you can come out of the Lord's discipline. Right? Like the uh, parable of the two sons. right? One son comes out of the household of the Lord. He goes on his own. So, in, in our lives also, we can sometimes do that. We can go out of the Lord's discipline. Right? And the Lord says that in Hebrews, right? That uh, only the legitimate children will accept discipline. If you are illegitimate, you will not accept discipline. Because you say, you are not my father. Why, why are you beating me? You have no right to beat me. I will run away from this house. So, Sometimes Christians are like that. They do not accept the Lord's discipline and they go away from the Lord's presence. But we, when we submit to the Lord's discipline and we submit to His teaching, His teaching in our lives, the Lord can then do such a marvelous work where the biggest failures in your life, just like Peter, when he denied the Lord Jesus Christ, denied and said, I will not be able to do this. When it really came to it, he denied the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But the Lord is promising Peter, saying that you will die on the cross. You will die on the cross. And by that you glorify me. The Lord is saying, I am going to work in you so powerfully that by the time I'm done, you will glorify me by my death, by his death. That's the same promise which the Lord has given every one of us. It is not you on your own strength trying to be victorious. Right? That means you are living under the law. You do not have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. But when you come under the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, you realize that it's the Holy Spirit now who is now trying to empower us, who is now trying to change us and transform us and mold us into that image of Christ. Right? I'll show you another uh, example. That example is of uh, Paul. When Paul gets converted on that road, uh, <coughs> yeah, uh, Acts nine. Acts chapter nine. This is the uh, experience where Paul uh, has an encounter with the Lord and he gets saved. Uh, Acts chapter nine, verse number four. Then he fell to the ground and said, and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to think against the goats. So the Lord says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And uh, then Paul becomes a, uh, an apostle. So it's one thing to be saved. It's uh, one thing just to become a Christian and be saved. But now, you have to go and preach this gospel. Right? Paul has to go and preach this gospel. And if you look at his early part of his life, people are still doubting whether he will be still genuine or not. They're still doubting whether he's still genuine or not. Right? And uh, using the words of Jesus Christ, Paul has a, has a great revelation of what the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about when he says, why are you persecuting me? He doesn't talk about uh, when he's persecuting the people, he says that you're persecuting me. Which means that the body of uh, the church is Christ himself. If you look at his uh, epistles, he talks about we being the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? We being hands, we being feet. Right? He gets that revelation from this word. Right? Which the Lord already tells him that you are persecuting me. Which means that uh, the church is the body of Christ. Right? So, uh, but the context was the Lord knows up front in his life. Right? Just like Peter where uh, the Lord knew that he will deny him and then he knew that he knows that he has to go and preach his gospel. So he gives him a prophetic word saying that you will die for me gloriously. So he can, Peter could go and preach boldly. He can preach boldly saying that follow this Jesus Christ even to death. Right? He could preach boldly. Same way to Paul, Lord Jesus Christ knew that everybody will question him saying that Hey, you persecuted the church. What right do you have to come and preach to us? What right do you have to come and preach in a church? You have no right. right? The Lord Jesus Christ knew what people would, uh, how people would be responding to Paul. So, So the context is uh, in chapter 9, he goes to uh, a place and there is a person called Ananias who the Lord sends to, uh, to restore Paul's vision because Paul loses his sight because of the brightness of uh, the Lord's presence. He loses his sight and he is uh, he's fasting for three days and the Lord sends Ananias uh, to him. Okay. And we will read from verse number 12. Uh, verse number 11 onwards. 
the, so the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold he is praying. And in a vision he seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, so that he may receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all the call on your name. In verse number 15. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear by name for the Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel. Verse number 16. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Yeah, I'll show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So interesting, right? For Peter, Peter denies the Lord Jesus Christ and he's afraid of death. Peter is afraid of dying. The Lord knows the softest, the worst area which Peter has failed and he promises him saying that you will die. You will die, you will glorify me and you will die. For Paul, he puts a different context. He knows the worst shame which Paul will have is, all his life is, that he persecuted Jesus Christ himself. He persecuted Jesus Christ himself. So the Lord tells up front, saying that, you will suffer for my name's sake. He will undergo suffering. And Paul calls it the suffering of Christ. Later on in this man, in his epistles, calls the suffering of Christ. So the Lord is restoring the greatest failure, the greatest failure, the greatest fear that you have in your lives. Right? For every one of us as well. Whatever you think you have failed the Lord so much and you have no victory on, you have no victory and you feel you are an embarrassment to God. How can I face God? How can I, how can I go and preach this gospel? When I myself have failed God and I cannot, how can I stand before God? <coughs> right? The Lord is giving a promise to every one of us. If you come under the Lord's teaching, if you come under the Lord's discipline, if you come under His ways, He will start working at us. He will start working in us so the biggest failure in our lives becomes a place of victory. Becomes an absolute place of victory. And you can boldly preach this gospel of Jesus Christ. Victorious. Not as a failure. You don't need to preach this gospel as a failure. Oh, I hope nobody sees it. It's not as a failure to preach this gospel. Preaching his gospel from a place of victory. Because if you look at uh, the Lord Jesus, what he says, For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Right? And uh, uh, Paul repeats this multiple times in, uh, in his episodes. I'll show you a couple of places where he refers to this thing. Uh, go to First Timothy, First Timothy, chapter 1, verse 12. Verse 17, chapter 1, verse 12. Verse 17, chapter 1, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Okay? It's the Lord Jesus Christ who puts Paul into the ministry. Okay, verse number 13. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. Okay? He is making the confession. I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. That was his former life. Right? He's saying, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. In verse number 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. 
However, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me, first, Jesus Christ must show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Saying, the Lord Jesus Christ has appointed me to preach his gospel, but not only that, I am going to be the first pattern of long suffering. For all the believers will come, all the generations of believers will come after me, I am going to be the pattern of long suffering. That once I was an insolent man and I persecuted the Lord Jesus Christ himself, but the Lord redeemed me by allowing me to go through persecution, by allowing me to go through tribulations. That's the way the Lord redeemed me. So now I have uh, authority to go and preach this gospel because I went through that tribulation. I suffered for the name of Christ. Right? It says that uh, I obtained mercy in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering. Okay, all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Let's quickly go to uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, rather 2 Corinthians, who so knows this passage. It's a list of uh, Paul's uh, persecution. Uh, first, Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 22 onwards. I'll read quickly. Second Corinthians 11, 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they seed of Abraham? So am I. Are the ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prison, more frequent. In deaths, often. From the Jews, five times I received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys, often in perils and water. In perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, in toil, in sleeplessness, often in hunger and thirst, in fastings, often in cold and nakedness. It's talking about all the sufferings which he goes through. It's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ allows him. Just like he prophetically says, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. The shame of his life, of he persecuted the Lord Jesus Christ himself, is being restored back, is being taken away, and is saying, he is now going through the same persecution of Jesus. So he is able to tell every one of us, every one of us, he is able to say, it's worth, it's worth go and suffer persecution for the name of Christ. Right? It's not like in, in embarrassment he's preaching, oh we all have suffered for the name of Christ. Right? Everybody will say, hey you are okay man, you beat up everybody and put everybody in prison. Very simply you are saying that. Right? But the Lord takes him through all that same thing and then he has authority. He has authority to go and preach his gospel and says that you have, we all have to go through the same thing suffering and persecution of Christ. When it comes to it, all godly in Christ will suffer persecution, the word says. Right? And he has the authority to preach the gospel because the Lord has taken him to that. It's not out of just empty words he's preaching the gospel. Right? The Lord has taken him through all that, so which is why he's able to preach the gospel. And uh, it says in chapter 12, it says uh, it's amazing when he gets that revelation that uh, chapter uh, 12 verse number 9 and he said to me my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness therefore I'll more gladly I'd rather boast of my, in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest in me so many people sometimes take this uh, weakness as moral weakness it's not moral weakness it's not that he was struggling in sin and uh, which is why it's like that, uh, its clarity is given out there. Its infirmities, right, uh, which means sicknesses, 
uh, verse number 10 is very clear. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches. Reproach means somebody falsely accusing uh, Paul. In needs. Can you imagine a great man of God called Paul had needs? Right? He was in need. In persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So the Lord, how he restores his children. He restores children. And the same story across, even if you look at the Old Testament, the same story is repeated. You remember Elijah, uh, he has this great victory. Right? Uh, he confronts uh, Jezebel and uh, all the prophets of Jezebel, he goes and kills them. Right? He has a great victory. But then Jezebel comes and says, okay, I'll show you what, I'm going to kill you. And uh, Elijah runs away. He runs away from uh, Jezebel's uh, presence. It's almost like he's fleeing from, uh, instead of confronting Jezebel, he flees. Not only flees, he gets so discouraged. Uh, I'll probably read that. Uh, go to Second Kings. Moses tried to do with his own strength. 
though the intention was right, he could not do it. Peter's intention was right, he could not do it. Right? Elijah's intention was right, he could not do it. Elijah will come and confront the false uh, Jezebelic spirit, the Babylon spirit of Babylon which is on the world. He will confront that. So the Lord is going to restore all his saints. That's the same promise for every one of us. But it's not a frivolous promise. We have to go under his correction, his discipline, his guidance. <coughs> Only then we can participate. I'll, I'll close with one, uh, with one verse. I'll go to First Peter. First Peter, chapter two, verse eight.
Lord, that we will come into the presence of God with great joy, Lord. Not with being an embarrassment to you. Not in as a failure, Lord. Not with guilt, Lord. Not with shame, Lord. But we'll, we'll be willing to die, Lord Jesus. We'll be willing to die death, Lord. Our own natural life. We'll be willing to die. We'll be willing to suffer for you, Jesus Christ. Or will not be, uh, will not turn back, Lord. Will not turn back, Lord Jesus Christ. But we will stand firm. Thank you, Lord. You are the one who is working in us. Thank you, Lord. I submit every one of the children, Lord. Every one of us here into your presence. The word says to the Lord, Lord, we, you are holding us. I have not lost anyone except that. One was already predetermined. That's what he said. You are holding the disciples. It is not the disciples, Lord, who thought that they are holding on to Jesus. You are holding on to the disciples. You are holding on to every one of us, Jesus. You are able to present us holy, holy, holy before, faultless, Lord, the word says. You are able to present us faultless before, before God. Thank you, Lord, for such a wonderful promise. We submit to your teaching, Lord. We submit to your Lordship. We submit to your correction. We submit, Lord, to your discipline. Lord, we submit, Lord, 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 do whatever is needed, Lord. Do whatever is needed, Lord. That we might come out as victorious on the other side. Not as a defeat, Lord. Not as an embarrassment. Lord. Let us come out as victorious on the other side, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, Lord. Let's pray for the body and the blood.